get started. Well, perhaps our audience uh, is stuck to the TVs right now watching the Elizabeth Smart saga. <coughs> that was a rather remarkable occurrence today, wasn't it? That's a uh, process. But uh, as exciting as that is, we know you're going to be rewarded for making the effort to be here tonight. We welcome you. I'm Garth Norman, President of Asian American Foundation, and we've been conducting this series uh, for several months now, uh, monthly lectures of, of research discoveries, archaeological and other, other research, and our, our particular interest, not exclusive, but particular interest, is those things which may have a bearing upon the form. And uh, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Bruce Warren uh, with us tonight, professor of, of uh, scripture, archaeology of the scriptures at uh, Brigham Young University. And Dr. Warren also a uh, long-term member of Ancient American Foundation. Society for Early Historic Archaeology, uh, an affiliate, and um, a longtime uh, officer, past president, and current, currently uh, director of research at the Ancient American Foundation. And uh, <coughs> before I uh, turn the time over to him, let me just mention our our lecture, which is planned for, for next month. Uh, mark your calendar, if you will, uh, as a general rule, the second Wednesday of each month. And uh, once we know this as well, occasionally we have to shift because of scheduling conflicts. That's as a rule our standard, our standard date. <coughs> so our, our lecture next month scheduled with Dr. C. Lance Harding, a um, uh, highly motivated, skilled, intelligent art historian. Uh, we'll be talking on ancient geometry. This is kind of a, 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 a little understood field, but uh, one definition might be in this type of research, a kind of a cosmic geometric signature that uh, <coughs> is manifest in, in ancient, ancient cultures and, and as a tool <coughs> or a sign of, um, of culture change, which is becoming very, very significant. <coughs> in terms of old world, new world contact, that uh, may reveal the Mormon connections as well, and origins from the nature of the reason in Mesoamerica. Excuse me. So uh, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Warren, and uh, he's going to share with you some of his recent, recent research uh, from Guatemala, uh, ruins of Camino Tuyo, which uh, we, along with others, believe is uh, the ancient city of Nephi, in the land of Nephi. And uh, if that's the case, uh, ruins and monuments, other artifacts there are going to uh, relate to the Book of Mormon. And this is an attempt to identify one, one such monument linking with a uh, significant time period and uh, an historic episode in the, in the Book of Mormon. And uh, Dr. Warren will give you an orientation uh, uh, to begin with to that land of Guatemala adjacent territory as the uh, possible or even probable land of Nephi 
in the Book of Mormon. We haven't found anything that doesn't fit. Uh, that argues against it. I haven't found anything in our studies anywhere else. It's anywhere remotely as compelling. So uh, that uh, is a very, very significant area for for research in our uh, in our program. So uh, please now to consider for Dr. Warren. Uh, this evening, <coughs> we're going to uh, consider some material which I think is very relevant to understanding what was going on about uh, the 2nd century B.C. in Highland Guatemala. Uh, one of the sources for, of uh, information that got me on the track of what we're, I'll be talking about tonight was this book called The Book of the Year by Munro Edmondson of Tulane University is dealing with calendars of ancient Mexico and northern Central America. And it's the best book out, even though it was published by the University of Utah Press. It's still a very good book. And uh, we'll be focusing on the area we call Mesoamerica. Uh, Mesoamerica is this area from uh, El Salvador off into Honduras and Nicaragua, uh, southeastern Mexico, up to about central Mexico. And so this general area we call Mesoamerica. We call it Mesoamerica rather than Middle America because it's the area where the high civilization took place. And Middle America is all the way from the Rio Grande River on the north to Panama on the south. But the area between the Rio Grande down to central Mexico does not have uh, culture materials that are, we would call part of the high civilization and the area of uh, Panama, Costa Rica, most of Nicaragua and parts of Honduras are not also part of that area of high civilization. So they call the area Mesoamerica rather than Middle America. It's like Mesopotamia. The area between the two rivers is Mesopotamia. This is the area between uh, basically North America and South America calling it Mesoamerica. Uh, this is, the, of course, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec through here, the huge uh, Olmec heads that uh, are famous for America's first civilization. Uh, the Olmec civilization has a big focus here on the Tuxla Mountains of Southern Veracruz. Uh, it goes back to probably about 1500 BC. And it's uh, an area that uh, we're very interested in uh, because there's a good number of parallels to the Jaredite people with the Olmecs. And we're referring to this generally as the land southward from the Isthmus of Tuanapec here all through Chiapas, Mexico here, and up in the Yucatan Peninsula in Belize, and over here in Nicaragua and uh, Honduras, mainly Honduras there. And you have some nice uh, examples of architecture that uh, have been put on this map. Most of it is late, uh, probably dating into uh, 500 to uh, 1500 A.D. time period. We should give you a little bit of the flavor of the uh, people of uh, Highland Guatemala. Uh, these are Maya Indians uh, on the way to the market and you can see they got some pigs here. And this is uh, 
one of those things that when you talk about travel, uh, nothing will slow you up more than pigs. <laughs> if you're going to market, uh, if you normally could make maybe 12 to 15 miles a day, they'll slow you down to five or six. Uh, the interesting thing about how the Maya women weave, you'll notice that uh, they tie the part around their waist and then they'll have a post out there on the other end and do the weaving and the movement is uh, with their hands and with their body moving back and forth. And this is very typical to see uh, walking with these bundles on their heads. Uh, sometimes you'll see them with a big basket of eggs going to market, maybe walking four or five miles, and you wonder how they're going to get all those eggs to market without uh, losing some. And these are uh, cayucos, they're canoes, and the thatcher structure, which is very typical of the lowland. Uh, jungle and tropical areas of uh, southern Mexico and uh, uh, northern Central America. Uh, scattered throughout that area are uh, archaeological finds like this uh, monument here on the coast of Guatemala at a site called El Bau. And here's a shaman who still is going out there uh, doing his rituals over these ancient uh, monuments. So there's still a connection between the living Maya to the ancient past. Uh, Guatemala, along the coast, as you look inland, you'll see lots of tall volcanic mountains. And, uh, it's known as a land of uh, mountains. It's also known as a land of eternal spring. I think the average uh, temperature there is around uh, 80 something degrees most of the year. And this is one of the typical valleys up in the highlands of Guatemala. And you can see the coastal areas here which would be similar to the, the west borders by the West Sea of the Book of Mormon expressions, and going up to the Piedmont areas and then up into the highlands itself. This is an area of, uh, where you see uh, a mountain range here going from the Caribbean at Puerto Barrios westward over to the Sierra Madre Mountains here on the Pacific Coast. Uh, this is a area that we've considered maybe being the narrow strip of wilderness of the Book of Mormon uh, because that narrow strip of wilderness runs from the East Sea to the West Sea and has the headwaters of the only river mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And uh, out of these mountains you get two rivers that flow down uh, to the Gulf of Mexico, to the north. Uh, outside uh, Guatemala City, they have a <clears throat> park in which they've made a relief model of the country of Guatemala. It covers probably two or three acres. And if you get up on a little tower there, you can get a good perspective of the topography of uh, Highland Guatemala. Of course, the water represents the Pacific coast. And uh, that narrow strip of wilderness, the mountain range, you can see it very distinctly here in this uh, uh, particular slide. Uh, in some places in the highlands, uh, there were ancient fortifications. Uh, here you're seeing a steep slope uh, that goes down to where there are trenches down below. Uh, there is a kind of an old story that uh, sometimes the Maya Indians, when they're working on the side of the mountains, 
uh, with their milpas or their cornfields, they're so steep that they have to tie themselves on so they won't fall off. <laughs> and you don't have to believe that. Uh, this could be an example of, uh, of a fortification trench that uh, has some archaeological material that goes back to what we call the pre-classic or back to the time of Christ. And uh, Garth Norman and others have been involved in mapping these trenches uh, and trying to find uh, just how old they are and what their history would be. There's another shot of a young man standing in one of the trenches. Now, this picture is taken from Guatemala City, looking out towards one of the uh, volcanic mountain peaks uh, that overlooks the city of Guatemala. And on the western edge of uh, Guatemala City is the site called Cominal Huyu. It means the place where the ancients were. Uh, the site used to have over 200 archaeological mounds, but uh, as the city of Guatemala expands, they destroy these mounds to get dirt to make adobe bricks, to make homes for the expanding population of the city of Guatemala. So we're down now to just a dozen or so mounds left at this huge site, what was once a huge site. And they've turned it into a park, so hopefully they'll keep uh, these few remaining mounds. Here is, uh, you can see the size of some of them. Uh, as you dig into these, you'll find tombs inside with uh, beautiful pottery. In such a mound like this at Kaminahuyu, they found a tomb that has uh, several hundred pottery vessels in it all dating back to about the second century BC. But the monument of our great interest here is called Stila Ten at Kaminal Huyu. This is one of the fragments. It was found in fragments and had to put it together. Uh, it's really not a stila, it's a throne. Uh, if you was to get four or five men and tried to pick the thing up, you'd see it had legs underneath it at one time. So it sat flat. And uh, of course this whole border design here is of a throne, the mat design. And the subject matter here is a kings. So obviously it is a throne and not a stela. And here is one detail. You can see an individual here. He's holding a kind of an ax here, kind of a wicked weapon. You have signs here representing the planet Venus, for example. Uh, these people were into uh, astronomy. This is a definition of uh, scriptural archaeology, and uh, it's a typical definition of archaeology. It could be Greek archaeology, it could be Egyptian archaeology, it could be Chinese archaeology. <coughs> but you see it focuses on cultural and social uh, developments in the past. Its main technique for recovering information past is locating excavating and analyzing remains and monuments. And they put this into a context which is very important and tied into the text of the scriptures. If you can't tie this to this, then you don't have the archeological connection. I think this part at the bottom is interesting because the main purpose of archaeology is not to prove or disprove the scriptures. 
The main purpose of archaeology is to discover the fullest and clearest possible picture of the past that relates to the scriptures. And I think we make a mistake of saying we're going to prove something all the time. And this we can go over very quickly as uh, how to go about trying to locate in ancient America where the lands of the Book of Mormon would be located. You have to deal with the archaeological picture of, of the Americas, the language distributions, the uh, complexity of the cultural developments. And then the, the very important question, and what was the level of societal development in the Book of Mormon? And that, when you analyze it, turns out to be not bands of hunters and gatherers or fishers, it's uh, not chieftains, it's a civilization where you have uh, economic classes and urbanization and where more than two states are involved before you have a civilization. And wh when one looks at the text of the Book of Mormon, they can conclude that the Book of Mormon is describing a people who achieved the level of civilization. Now that's an important breakthrough because the problem has always been where in ancient America were these people at? Where were they located? And once you arrive at this level of complexity of their society that it was a civilization that immediately eliminates 75 percent of the Americas. There's only two places in ancient America that had civilization before the coming of the Europeans. And that was Mesoamerica and the Andean region of South America. And uh, we'll just uh, point out the bottom here. The first thing you need to do research here is exhaustive Book of Mormon analysis. And you have to deal with geology and ge geographic research, archaeology, biological anthropology, ethnographic research, that's the study of modern native peoples, the language research, and the word valid is in front of all those. Because a lot of times we see people using this kind of information and it's not valid. It has to be valid to be worthwhile. This is taken from a typical anthropology text of locating the different levels of society, the band, the tribe, the chieftain, the state. And what we're looking at is this column over here. And so when you're looking for a civilization in ancient America, here is a set of maps of about 300 AD for both North and South America. And as you can see, uh, there's nothing in North America that's at the level of civilization. You have to go here to Mesoamerica to find it. In the South America, the same thing. There's nothing out in this area of civilization. You have to go to the Andean region here to find it. So that eliminates th where the land of the Book of Mormon could have been it has to be one or the other. Uh, we have outlined here in this uh, particular <coughs> map the area of Mesoamerica. So you have Guatemala here in Chiapas, Mexico, Oaxaca, Veracruz, etc. Uh, back in the time period we're interested in, uh, between, say, 2500 B.C. and A.D. 400, uh, here are some sites like this is Kaminahuyu by Guatemala City. So you'll know where this monument 
is located in space. I can't really read those, but it says Hill Shim and a few interesting things there. Okay. Uh, the University of Penn State uh, did a major project at uh, Kaminaho U back in the 19, early 1970s and the late uh, 1960s. And one of the uh, maps they put out shows a major chieftain here at Kaminaho U. And there's other chieftains like Amatitlan and Chimaltenango, and these would all be gro grouped into a, what we <coughs> call a state. And so you have a state here in Highland Guatemala uh, that could be one of the states we would be in necessity of having if we're going to have a civilization. Now, does the site of Kaming Nahuyu have the archaeological history? As you can see, it begins with a ceramic phase called Arevalo, about 1500 BC. And so we're not really getting into the area of our interest until we hit the Providencia phase here, around 450 to 250 BC. By the time you get up here at uh, early classic or Aurora, uh, you're getting to the end of the Book of Mormon period. So it's this period right in here that we are interested in time. And so there is a lot of archaeological development at Kaminaw View back in the proper time span. Now, this is a drawing of the uh, so called Stilatin or the uh, throne. Uh, you can see the one individual here has a trident upside down over his eye. He has the axe here. Here's a bearded uh, kind of monst monstrosity. <laughs> Looks like it has uh, the canines of a jaguar. Uh, there's a serpent in there, and uh, there's some glyphs up here that have uh, been pretty well eroded. There's a qu quite a number of glyphs down here. But there are three calendars that dating this event. There's one calendar date, there's a second, and then this whole head here is a Olmec uh, calendar year, and they all date to the year of 147 BC. So this whole scene is taking place in the year 147 BC in the Gregorian calendar. Now, we passed this pretty quickly. Uh, one of those calendar dates was seven wind Kaminahuyu, eight wind Teotihuacan, clear down in Guatemala, since Teotihuacan is up north uh, east of Mexico City, and the Olmec. And so the Olmec 147 is one lard, for Teotihuacan is eight wind, and for Kaminahuyu is seven wind. And if you don't know these little details about calendars, you can get all mixed up, confused, and uh, that's a danger. Uh, a little more complete uh, reconstruction of this throne, where they've tried to put in some details that are really missing, like the legs and uh, so forth. Now, uh, Garth Norman made an interesting set of uh, observations. Uh, we're going to say that this may represent uh, King Noah of the Book of Mormon and this Limhi. And uh, the name of uh, Noah means rest. And he points out this trident upside down over the eye could mean rest. It also can mean death, and that'd be the rest of death. <laughs> and uh, down here, uh, Limhi can mean supplication and life. And you have the 
arms here in the supp supplication position and a life symbol here, the trident upside down from his ear spool. Uh, it would be nice to have uh, those names, if, if these represent those names, in uh, syllables. But uh, until we get that lucky, we have to deal with uh, symbolisms that may have the meaning we're looking for. Now, <clears throat> this is the, what the glyphs begin to look like. Uh, the ones up in the upper right-hand corner with the person that had the trident upside down over his eye, uh, this is what the glyphs look like. And we'll say more about these later. Well, where we have damage, we just say indeterminate. Uh, one here, T511, that's uh, Thompson, who has classified all these glyphs. So that's his number in his catalog. Uh, if you're a specialist, you'd be interested in that number, because you can look it up, see how close it is to this. But it means muluk, which is a word for water. But you can see a lot of this is uh, indeterminate. Here's a couple of dots and it could be a bar, which would be five if it had the lines down here on the end. But they're damaged there. So we just say it's indeterminate. And can that be lifted up on the bottom? Okay, let's go to the next one then. Because this one right here is a glyph that means capture. <laughs> so somebody's been captured. Now the, the main body of the hieroglyphs down at the bottom of the monument uh, are these. And here you have three bars and a Wienel sign, which means 20. So that's 300. And the way you read these, you read them by two columns at a time from left to right. So you read the five bars for 15 to the Wienel sign for 20. And you come down here and here. Actually, that's a large sign upside down, meaning death with a bar and two dots on top, which is seven death. Uh, this is a symbol for a successor sorcerer, so we can get an idea of what these people are into, sorcery. The blood uh, scattering symbol, there's the thumb, and, or the thumb up there and the finger. This is the capture sign, that's a moon. There's a seating, and uh, well, we'll see more details on this later. In other words, you read it like this. Okay. And we can skip over that. And that. And that. Now, when you get into this, uh, you can get dates out of it. And one of the dates that comes up here is uh, Tuesday, the 9th of January, 147 BC. There's the calendar dates and information. And uh, so the, everything on this monument happens within a th the 300-day period, which starts with the New Year's Day of the Kaminahu local calendar and ends with the New Year's Day of the Teotihuacan calendar. Uh, 
this is either the date of somebody being killed or it could represent his birth date showing he's dead but I suspect it's uh, the date that he was killed it's on the seventh flower that's flower upside down the two eyes and the nose or the mouth and here's your animal spirit companion so that's part of this uh, sorcery that's going on there's the capture compound and so mainly what we want to do now is just get some of the ideas of what's happening on this mon this uh, throne it's a hail is successor sorcerer so somebody is succeeding the person who died. Here's the great Ahau and the fire or a K sign. And this is actually a very important element here. Because it tells you why this person was killed. He was killed by a new fire ceremony. It begins every 52 year cycle of the calendar. And so he was ceremonially killed by fire. Now here you get the Hunal or the royal headband, so that's telling you it's kingship involved here. Here you have a royal succession, so again you have the symbols that is royalty and one king is succeeding the other. And down here at the bottom we have some dates that uh, are important, but uh, you don't need to bother with them. This is uh, the source of some of the information. Like Federico Fossum had an early writing system of Coming Now You paper given in 1996, in which he was able to decipher a good deal of the hieroglyphs on this uh, throne. Uh, from the book of uh, Linda Sheely and Peter Matthews, The Code of Kings, The Language of Seven Maya Temples and Tombs, 1998, they tell us that because of Fossen's study, that the most likely language on, of those glyphs is Cholan, Maya. That's the Maya down around Palenque, the famous archaeological site of Palenque. And words like Wienel for 20, uh, Hunal for the headband, and the name of the corn god are examples that is from a Cholan language. Now, this date here is the date of uh, the new fire ceremony in which the first king is killed by fire. That would be Wednesday, the 18th of April, 147 BC. And interestingly enough, it's exactly 208 years from the origin of the famous Long Count calendar, which was in 355 BC. So these people know about that Long Count calendar. And the ceremony of the new fire starts every 52 years. So this means that you're dealing with four calendar rounds from the origin of the Long Count calendar to the year this king was put to death by fire. Now the way they put him to death is pretty horrible, so we won't describe that for you. It's not a pleasant thing. Uh, there's a lot of torture and whatnot going on before they are burned. But that might have been the fate of King Noah.
Okay, now I'd probably make a few summary remarks here. Uh, if this is a parallel to something in the Book of Mormon, it has to be something that happened in the year 147 BC. Because that's what the calendar is or the monument is telling you in three different calendars. Obviously, a very important event. Uh, from that throne, you know that a king has died. He's going to be succeeded by a sorcerer who is going to be the next king. So that's probably the nature of the uh, idolatry that uh, King Noah is being accused of by the prophet Abinadi. He was into this sort of stuff. Uh, we know that uh, there are a number of parallels here that indicate this really is a succession of one king by a new king. And our parallel to the Book of Mormon is in the Book of Mosiah, uh, chapter 17 and 19, which deals with uh, the prophet Abinadi going to King Noah and accusing him of idolatry and not following the uh, Mosaic law and essentially telling him to repent. And King Noah really doesn't buy that. So he uh, puts the prophet Ben Dai in prison and, and uh, eventually he has him put to death by fire. And then as Abinadi is dying, he tells, uh, makes a prophecy that uh, King Noah will die by fire and some of his people in the future. Uh, the one who succeeds him, of course, is uh, Noah's son, Limhi. But uh, by this time, the Lamanites have uh, taken over the area. Uh, Limhi is allowed to become the king of the city of Nephi and uh, in general land of Nephi, but under the control of the Lamanites. In other words, Limhi is in captivity to the Lamanites. He's been captured. He's forced to pay 50% of their wealth to the Lamanites. Uh, he has to, according to the throne, if we have the right parallel here, wait 300 days before he can actually go on the throne succeeding his father. Because the ceremonies have to be on New Year's Day in their calendar. And so they delay until that New Year's Day comes. So we have a number of parallels then. Uh, between the content on the throne and the content of Mosiah chapter 17 and 19. Uh, I haven't counted these up and did a statistical analysis, but statistics don't tell you very much usually, unless you've got a lot of good data. We don't have that much here to work with. Uh, but I think it'd be hard to say that there isn't a good circumstantial case here for the parallels between what's on that face of that throne and what's in the books of Mosiah chapter 17 and 19. Uh, there's, if you count them up, there'd be 10 to a dozen parallels. And at the base of the pages in those chapters of the Book of Mormon, they're dealing with two years, the year 158 BC and the year of uh, King Noah being burned is 147 BC, the date that's on the, on the throne in three different calendars. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, it's, it's kind of a black basalt, so it's volcanic in ultimate origin. And uh, Highland Guatemala is a volcanic mountainous area, so 
but I don't know if they've gone out to try to find the exact uh, source in Guatemala where the stone came from. But I would estimate, though, that this uh, stone that uh, was used to make the throne probably weighed a ton. So it's a, it's a big, heavy thing. Uh, well, all the stones from monuments from Kaminahi are not all of the same uh, quality. But this was found at Kaminahi, so wherever it came from, they, they brought it there and used it as a throne. Uh, one of the interesting things about the throne was that it was deliberately broken up in several fragments. And when the Archaeologists found that they had to eventually take the fragments they had and fit them together just before they could even get the uh, information, the drawings and the hieroglyphs that you see in the drawings. Do you know the altitude of uh, Guatemala and the mountains around it? Well, uh, Guatemala City is at about 5,000 feet. So it's, uh, of course, the mountains would be much higher, <laughs> but that's what the, the valley is. It's much like the same altitude as Oaxaca Valley to the north in southern Mexico. Well, what you see in, in those three calendar dates on the face is just the year. Uh, so you're not going into the day of the year. So eight wind is, is the year bearer, eight wind in the coming off your calendar. So they're not giving a day and a month, they're just... Uh, no, you'd have to go into the hieroglyphs to get some of that information. Uh, I think they're trying to say that this event that is the subject of that carving was so important that they put it in three different calendars. Well, the, when, when you think, think of Palenque and the classic archaeology, uh, that's the dating of the archaeological ruins. The language, Maya languages, when they try to date them as their appearance through time, uh, that's a separate dating problem. And so uh, Cholon would probably go back in his origin maybe to uh, five or six or maybe even a thousand BC. The oldest dialect in the Maya family goes back to about 2600 BC. And the other daughter languages break off through time. And the linguist pretty well can give you an idea of when they separate a daughter language from a parent language. So is the, is the is it spreading in your mind? Is it spreading towards Uh, towards, because it spreads from the Planky area over to Copan, for example. Yeah, that's the same grouping of Maya languages, kind of a lowland thing. But the surprise is to have that up in the highlands. It's not supposed to be there, but it shows up there. Are you suggesting that the Aztecs are descendants of uh, the uh, Colony? Mm, uh, <laughs> Probably yes and no. 
is that a good <laughs> way to <laughs> confuse you? Well, they, if you went back to the origin of the Aztec language, you'd say no. But if you go into who the Aztecs interacted with, intermarried with, then you can start saying yes later on. Yeah. Uh, in other words, the Uto Aztecan languages originated, as far as I know, in the area of Death Valley. And the Aztecs don't come into Mesoamerica until about 1200 AD, much, much later. But they inherit the Toltec civilization and, and they intermarry with the Toltecs. And the Toltecs, if you want to talk about them, then you could probably say they go back in their roots to the Book of Mormon time period. And you mentioned that if you were going to that, you've got two locations that you've got that from America, and you mentioned something about South America, as far as this historical evidence, people being there. Uh, there's uh, several reasons why we're not bringing Andean region into this area. One is the languages are totally different. Uh, they are totally different from those in Mesoamerica. Uh, another is that there's no interaction between the Andean civilization and the Mesoamerican except by maritime trade going along the Pacific coast. And we recognize that but it has no great impact on the development of either civilization, the Andean or the uh, Mesoamerican. Uh, other reasons for selecting Mesoamerica is coming from the internal evidence of the Book of Mormon itself. Uh, for example, it mentions uh, one period that the division between the Lamanites of the land of Nephi and the Nephites of the land of Zarahemla was this narrow strip of wilderness that runs from an east sea to the west sea. And out of that is the headwaters of the Sidon River. Uh, if you start with the southern tip of South America at the Straits of Magellan and start going northward, you won't find a mountain range that goes from the Pacific to the Atlantic in the east-west direction. Uh, you won't find it until you get to Guatemala, that's the first one. Now if you go up into North America, you're not going to find a mountain range that goes from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And so that helps focus you on Mesoamerica from in internal evidence. Well, there's, you won't find any other Teotihuacan calendar dates that come in off you. Later on, you will find Teotihuacan influence on the classic coming off you sequence in the architecture. And so what you're seeing here is much, much earlier that someone in Highland Guatemala developed that calendar that they call Teotihuacan. They call it that because later on, several centuries later on, it's that Teotihuacan where you find all the evidence of it. That's why it's called Teotihuacan. And so... You're, the, saying, you're saying the influence went from Oh yeah, it's much earlier. Some, somebody eventually had moved to the area of the Valley of Mexico and the area of Teotihuacan with that calendar. And then it becomes established that the huge urban center of Teotihuacan and they call it the Teotihuacan calendar. Was there any, I mean, do you see any evidence of influence of that Teotihuacan area um, coming into Kamenabu? I mean, is that? And not at the uh, late pre classic period that, we're, that this throne is from. You don't see any Teotihuacan influence coming in until about 500 AD. Part of the, uh, all the reasons you're asking those questions about David, is there significance that I need to know? I've never heard of I mean, that's pretty impressive that you know all of that. 
what <laughs> Well, I should say that Alan Miner uh, is very intensively in, been researching uh, literature on literature on uh, Mesoamerican problems in the Book of Mormon, and he's developing a series of books called Step by Step through the Book of Mormon. So that's why he's really into this. But uh, calendars is one thing that you, I try to avoid saying very much about because if you get a book like this, you'll find that there's over a hundred different variants of the calendars in Mexico and Guatemala. And uh, unless you're really, really interested, don't bother. <laughs> It'll drive you mad. Any other questions? Okay, I guess that uh, covers uh, the subject. Buildings and canon grid systems have their origin in a simple geometric figure, which uh, I refer to as the golden mandala. Mandala, a circle inside of a square with its uh, diagonal. The Greeks obtained their knowledge of proportional measurement from the Egyptians as well as the Babylonians in the Middle East. They not only knew about the square root of Two and five derived from the diagonals of the square, but their statues were laid out according to a geometric grid based on the equilateral triangle, root three, and the seal of Solomon, or Star of David. Uh, Archaeologist Garth Darwin has discovered evidence 
that these geometric principles are an equal units of measurement from the Middle East were also known in ancient Mesoamerican temple architecture and works of sculpture. Not only is there significant evidence for the use of the gold mandala geometry, but also equivalent cubic measurements. Dr. Hardin and I collaborated on a, uh, on a research trip to uh, Europe, the British Museum, and the uh, Louvre in Paris. Uh, measured some 200, made some 200 measurements of uh, uh, ancient Middle Eastern sculptures and found the same uh, measuring design system that I had previously suffered exactly measuring among Mexico with uh, the same standard measure, which uh, should be of interest to us as we consider unsociated cultural contacts and migration. The knowledge of geometry may be a key to understanding many of the mysteries found in Mesoamerica, including origins, manifest from intellectual knowledge that influenced the rise of Mesoamerican civilization from the ancient Near East uh, as uh, set forth in the Book of Mormon. So, uh, the Lance's lecture at times gets a little heavy. But he's promised me to be well illustrated and we'll show all the photographs and slides. There are lots of, lots of photographs and illustrations. Guarantee you a, a, an exciting insight into in some uh, very significant original research uh, of interest, uh, wide interest potentially. Anybody want to make an announcement or comment? Dr. Allen, stand up. <coughs> Give us a little company man. Well, thank you. Uh, on uh, uh, this month, I guess it's next week already, isn't it? Uh, Friday and Saturday, the 21st and 22nd, we have the conference. Uh, the Thanksgiving point starts Friday at, uh, at noon, then picks up again on a Saturday morning. We have a number of uh, speakers, including uh, uh, some people in this room. Uh, Gareth and Alan have, uh, have uh, consented to be on a panel discussion. Uh, Bruce will be one of the speakers uh, talking also on this subject that he's talked on tonight. We have uh, Royal Skousen who has uh, done quite a bit of work, uh, with a lot of work with the uh, original manuscript of the Book of Mormon. Do a presentation, a fellow by the name of Edwards, uh, uh, who has done uh, a lot of work with Chiasmus. Uh, Donald Barry also has done uh, uh, written on the subject of Chiasmus and Hebrewism in the Book of Mormon. Uh, I don't know if you know Dave A.C. Uh, Dave is the director of the foundation. Uh, who did I leave? Who did I leave out? We do have, we do have two keynote speakers. One uh, on Friday is, is uh, Elder. Uh, this is pretty, it's not mine, is it? Oh, that's not mine. <laughs> it was uh, uh, Elder. Uh, Heller Wells, Robert Wells will be the keynote uh, speaker on Friday at uh, uh, Friday at two o'clock, and Heller Ted Brewerton will be a keynote speaker on Saturday. Uh, also, there's some fun activities uh, involved, including a, a professional auctioneer auction and a lot of things that have been, you know, we tried to give it a Mesoamerica theme, but there's other vacation places that they're auctioning. There's food provided. It's a, you didn't want me to take this long, did you, Garth? It's a, we, we'd love to have you come, and if you know people, uh, uh, because it's a, we appreciate the work that uh, Ancient America Foundation is doing and has done. As I sit in here in this small audience uh, here tonight, I, I thought, let's see, there's about 400,000 people in the Utah County, and, and uh, the 20 here, but the ones that are here uh, apparently have a deep interest in it. Goes, uh, goes real deep and as I look at, as I heard Bruce talking uh, and I uh, thought about his life, the contributions that he's made, uh, they'll go on, they'll go on uh, throughout history. Same thing with uh, Garth and, and Alan and others who have done it. So we appreciate uh, being here tonight and thanks Garth for giving that opportunity. Thank you.
Do you want, want to ask any questions in terms of registering for for their conference at Thanksgiving for it? Uh, if so, you contact him afterwards. Uh, it's get that deal done. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hope to see you next time.